Hello, thank you. Um, before we get started, I actually need to go over something. These are my boys. Um, the first thing I do when I come home from a conference is show them the video of my talk. And so what I would like for everyone here to do, if you could, is me to pretend to come on stage and you cheer as loud as you can so that when I come home, they think everyone loves their daddy. So I'm going to go back to the title slide and I'm going to run up on the stage and uh, just as loud as you can would be great. Thank you. Sit down, sit down, sit down. I've got a lot to go over. Thank you so much. Wow, it's great to be here. Um, guys, come on, I've got a lot to cover. Um, so I'm Jeff Cross. I'm the tech lead of the mobile team on Angular. Uh, and as the title says, I'm probably the most trustworthy person here at the conference. So uh, if you're going to one talk the whole time, this is probably the best one to be at. Uh, you actually get two talks for the price of one today because my colleague Alex Rickabaugh is going to give a talk right after mine. Uh, so Alex and I are kind of like the band in sync that we collaborate on a lot of things. We work together. We make albums together. Uh, but every once in a while, we do solo projects, just like you know, I'm Justin Timberlake in this uh, metaphor, and he's Joey Fatone. Uh, but we always come back together, just like in sync, which we'll be doing right after this conference to get back to work on making mobile awesome. So my goal is to equip you with the knowledge so that you can decide a mobile strategy for your applications, like picking the tools and uh, strategies to use for serious applications, not your toy apps you build at home. And then Alex is going to talk about making the most of your mobile web experience. Uh, so I've got 20 minutes. So what can we fit in 20 minutes? I think we could probably evaluate and compare every tool and library and uh, idea in the mobile landscape. Or maybe just to be practical, we could focus on the, the pieces that pertain to Angular. So looking at some, some tools that are specifically integrated with Angular. So there's going to be some information overload. I'm going to be talking really fast. Um, but don't worry about it, because I'm going to share the slides. They've got lots of information and links inside. And so if you get lost, uh, you'll, you'll catch up later. So let's take a look at some of the mobile enthusiasts who go on and on about their tools way longer than any of, any of us care to hear about them. And, and to be fair, we'll start with the Angular mobile team. So from progressive web apps? Oh, progressive web apps. Who's from progressive web apps? 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 All right, that's Rob Wormald. Um, we talk a lot about progressive web apps. It's actually where we spend a lot of our time on the mobile team is making it easy to build these progressive web apps. And if you haven't heard that word before, that term before, it's just a way of thinking about building web apps to feel like installed native applications, to, to have the same kind of feel and behavior, installed to home screen, loading instantly, working offline, those kinds of things. Um, so we talk a lot about it. And the question is, is it the one true way to build applications today? Can you drop everything you've thought about building mobile applications and just build with progressive web apps? And we'll look into that a little bit more later. But first, let's look at some other enthusiasts. So, Adam is a developer on Ionic, as you can hear from the five times he said it. Uh, Ionic, everyone's heard of Ionic probably. It's, it's this cool hybrid thing built on Cordova. So you build apps as web apps, but you can ship them in phones and you can mix with native features. You can add native UI and access native APIs while having a nice experience and sharing a lot of code with web apps and using your web app skills. So we've got progressive web apps. We've got Ionic, which is the hybrid apps. What else do we have? So there's a product called Native Script, uh, as you saw there. Uh, and Jen Looper will actually be presenting later. So will Ionic folks. Uh, Brandy and Adam will be presenting, which you should definitely check out their talk. So Native Script is kind of a different approach. It's not hybrid in the same sense as Cordova, but you do get to write JavaScript uh, and TypeScript. And it actually runs at runtime with the application, but you use native UI. So you have the advantage of fast uh, native UI with hardware acceleration, nice smooth scrolling, all of that with, with a lot of ease. Um, so we've got these three contenders. Um, and uh, you know what? No single strategy has to be used in isolation. Actually, most of these tools probably will be combined with something else, maybe web and native script, web and Ionic, or maybe no web at all in some cases. And so uh, we want to. We want to look at how they complement each other, what, what strengths and advantages of, of are the different 
uh, choices you might make. So the questions we want to answer today are, do I need a web app? Is it strategically sound for my app to be built purely as a web app with no installed native component? Or if it's not sufficient or necessary, should I choose hybrid or native JavaScript, Ionic native script, or some tools like them? Uh, so let's take a look into the state of mobile in Angular land. Uh, I've got four categories I've broken this analysis down to. The first is distribution, how users get a hold of your app. Capabilities, you know, what are the APIs and the things you can and can't do with different approaches. Performance, how do they, uh, what are the performance characteristics of different approaches? And productivity, how effective is your team going to be with different tools? Um, so starting with distribution, how do users get your app? Searchability is a big factor here. How do they find it in search engines and app stores? Uh, shareability, how does content from your app get shared, or how does your app itself get shared? Uh, the first use experience ability. When a user hears about your app, finds it in a search engine, finds it somewhere else, how easily can they use it? And how does the updating of your app occur? Uh, so getting into searchability, how do users discover your app or its content via search engines? So uh, there's actually an interesting fact. Um, the company Alex and I work for is called Google, and we've had this website since about 97, where you can type in anything you want in a text field, and it will look around the whole internet and try to find content that uh, matches what you want. And we have ads on it, and when people click those ads, we get money for it. And this is actually how we fund Angular development. So Angular seems like this great project, but actually we have to make money somehow, and that's how we do it. Uh, and it's actually, so it's a big way people find apps and find content, find news articles or whatever. And, uh, and they've gotten pretty good at crawling websites, and even in the past few years, they've gotten really good at crawling JavaScript apps, Angular apps, uh, Backbone, Ember, or whatever you've built with JavaScript. They can, they can render it and crawl it and index it. Um, but even if your site, for whatever reason, has a hard time being crawled or indexed, or some search engines just don't have as advanced of crawling, now with Angular 2, there's this uh, capability of pre-rendering using Universal. So with web apps, you get to take it, the web apps are the most easy experience to take advantage of search engine optimization. And with Universal, you pretty much eliminate all the uh, downsides before you may have had with search engine optimization. Um, so hybrid and native app content can actually appear in Google search. You can give Google hints about uh, links to your content and, uh, and they can open it in your native app and show it in the, the web view on your Android phone. Uh, but uh, the, the thing is it has to be backed by a web app with URLs. So any piece of content that you have uh, that you tell Google, hey, this piece of content is in my native app, you actually have to have a fallback URL that, that it can go to on the web. And that's a big theme of a lot of the, the things we're going to talk about, is URLs are, even with native app, are still a key component to um, being able to index content, share it, and things like that. Uh, so web search isn't the only game in town. Uh, mobile operating systems provide operating system level search uh, where you can search content, um, search content on your device or on the web, and they provide app store search. So uh, with web apps, you can, uh, you can not appear in the app store search. So if I have a progressive web app, you know, maybe install on my home screen and all that, but uh, app stores like the iPhone app store and Android app store just don't show those apps because you know, whatever reasons. Uh, public web app content may appear in your native operating system search, though. So on, on my iPhone, I can you know, search my, my device, search for AngularJS, and it's got a mix of websites here that match that, as well as I have some podcasts below that I've subscribed to that it shows content from. Um, and so you might need a hybrid or native JavaScript app if your users expect to see you in the App Store search or if they want to see your app's private content using native search. So if you have a web app, your public content can show up in your operating system native search, uh, but your private content can only show up if you're installed in a native app on the user's device. So in summary of searchability, if your app and its content should be discovered in major search engines, there must be a crawlable web version. You have to have a web app. If your app should be discovered by app stores, there must be a native or hybrid version of the app. And if your app's private content should be discoverable, via um, operating system level search, there must be a native or hybrid version of the app installed. So part two, shareability. How easily do users share your content? Uh, let's apply this to web first. So with web, if I want to share a photo or content or anything, it's really up to me as a developer to figure out how and where the user can share that. Uh, a lot of times, if I want to get a photo from the device, I'll just have a file input and they'll have to select 
the photo from their file system and get it from there. There's no integration with the native gallery or um, uh, other APIs. And, and there's no way for me to just say, I have the content now, now let the operating native sharing mechanism take over and share it to wherever they have. It's up to me to work directly with, uh, with web APIs. So I can send a text message with Twilio or I can send a mail with an email with Mailgun or SendGrid or something like that. But it's a little bit more friction. The user has to provide some authentic authentication for those kinds of things. Um, so it's not a nice experience. This is being worked on. Uh, someone on the Chrome team is working on specking, uh, being able to share from a web app and let your native sharing mechanism handle it so apps that you've installed that can handle that type of document can, can take it. Um, so another way to put it is the developer chooses where a user can share, how and where they can share, and, a, um, and the, whereas on native, it's up to the user to install apps that can handle sharing content. So another, the other side of it is can a web app handle the shares that come from other apps? So there's no way to do that right now. So if I want to share something from my photo app, there's no way for a just web app to show up in the bottom part, uh, or the part where I select where to share it to. Um, so, but that is also being worked on as part of the uh, complement to the same spec I just talked about where web apps can be registered to handle sharing intents. So let's take a look at the other side and look at hybrid and native JavaScript apps. Um, you've got the flexibility of the web. You can do everything you can do with web, use the same API as a web, but you also have the native operating system support. So you can just defer to what the operating provides in terms of share targets for content. Uh, and plugins for Ionic, Cordova, and NativeScript make this pretty easy to share uh, with, with little effort and little configuration. Um, and they can also handle shares from other applications. So you can, you can declare that your app is capable of handling certain types of content to be shared, and then uh, when somebody shares, they can choose your app and you can handle it however you'd like. Uh, so to summarize, <coughs> excuse me, a uh, web app is currently limited to sharing with web APIs and can't handle shares from other applications. And native and hybrid can provide OS level sharing integration. So if that's important to you, then you'll need some kind of native component to your strategy. Uh, so first, use experience ability. How does the user get your app and its content? Uh, generally, the faster the user can start using your app, the better. I don't know if anyone disagrees with that. Okay. Uh, so. Clicking a search engine result and immediately seeing a restaurant review is better than clicking a link and installing an app to see a review. This is kind of a dig on Yelp. I don't know if Yelp is popular here, but uh, they are always nudging me to install their native application where everything I need is actually in the web app, so I have to scroll through things to, to get to it. So installation requirements equals friction. This adds friction to the process of users using your app. And friction uh, turns out to be abandonment, and the abandonment is usually pretty bad. Um, for, for this example, actually, uh, the Google Plus app, they, when they had this mobile app that people would show up to and click links, uh, they have this giant thing that would show up on the screen and get in between you and the content. And they have a link where you can visit the mobile site, but they actually had a 69% abandonment rate with this page um, just by having this here. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, abandonment might not matter to your app. Like people turning around, leaving your app might not matter. Uh, there are actually some legitimate cases where you may not care. Um, like if your native app is just, you have to be native, you can't even get a fraction of the experience on web, uh, then maybe installation isn't such a bad thing. Or maybe you've got a small internal app for a small user base, something they'll install once and use for years. You, you don't really care about the installation friction so much as a news site or a, a review site where you're handling lots of traffic every day uh, for people wanting quick information. So forced or pressured installation needs strong justification and careful consideration. You should really give some thought to this. Think about how it impacts your bottom line and, uh, and figure out if you can um, ease that a little bit better, provide more value in your mobile app, um, ease the, the amount of hints you give to them. Uh, Android's actually introduced something interesting, uh, which is called Android Instant Apps, where you can have native apps that you can access from the web without installing your app yet. And you know, it may encourage the user to install the app after that point, uh, but this is exciting, and I, I'd like to see more, uh, more integration with this with, with Ionic and NativeScript. Um, so in summary of the first use experience, be where your users are. Uh, remove the obstacles between users and their content. Uh, get out of the way as much as you can. And give tasteful hints to let your users know about your installable app. Like progressive web apps are a good example of this. 
uh, Opera, Firefox, Chrome, they all will, after the user's been using an app for a while, they'll give a hint on the screen like, hey, you seem to like this app, maybe you want to install it to your home screen. And it, it's not even a native app, but it goes to their home screen so they can launch it from their home screen after that point, but it's not too annoying. So last part of distribution, updatability. How do you get the app to your users? Uh, so this is pretty critical to user experience. Uh, if, if your update process, <coughs> excuse me, if the time between you adding features or uh, fixing things is uh, delayed getting to users, then you know, they don't get access to new features quickly enough or critical security fixes or critical performance improvements. And so uh, choosing your strategy based on how you can do this is, uh, is worth some time. Uh, so on the web, the standard process is you upload something as a developer to your server and the user just refreshes and they've got it. And that's not bad. Uh, they, you know, they get it after everything loads. But even with Service Worker now, you can do more advanced loading of the application in the background. So your application, your server can say, hey, I've got some updates, I'm gonna push them down to the Service Worker. Service Worker can update things in the background. So the next time user opens the app, you can uh, reload the app with all the new content without having to fetch anything over the network. So you get kind of a native-like experience with that, but you're still getting fresh content and fresh fixes and features for the user. Um, so let's look at hybrid and native JS, how their update process works. So if you change anything with your app's binary uh, or, or any native features, you have to republish to app stores. And, and this can halt the process because with iOS, you've got to go through approval and review. And uh, even with Android and, and iOS, you can require manual approval from the user if you've changed anything like permissions with your application. Um, and you may have to wait for the user. They may not know that they need to update the app manually. Um, and hybrid apps, they need to be republished if the native features have changed or embedded content has changed. So it's kind of an advantage with hybrid apps that you can have a lot of your content just be remotely loaded in web views. And so if you can change that content as much as you want, as long as what's shipped in the app that gets installed on the device isn't changing, like you're not adding new native plugins or changing the, the skin that's, that's loaded on the device, then, then you don't have to push uh, to the app stores until you add native features. And I know NativeScript is also working on some ability to be able to do that as well. Um, so updatability summary. Web provides the shortest path between deploy time and updated app available to the user. Uh, hybrid and native JavaScript have potentially longer turnaround because of app store review, uh, delays in automatic updating, and a potential need for user approval. So having covered the distribution, let's move on to the next major section, which is capabilities. And so what I'm going to cover here are APIs that are available in native or web and kind of looking at the discrepancies between what you can do in what places. And I'm looking at it as kind of binary, like you can or can't do things on web, uh, but it's actually more nuanced than that. And, uh, and I encourage you to look some more if there are particular APIs you care about, like is it, it may be much better on native or much better on web. Um, that's something we're not going to get into a lot today, but you can research on your own. Um, so hybrid and native apps, they have access to APIs that web apps do not yet. So a lot of these APIs are things that are being worked on and maybe are in experimental branches of browsers. Um, so let's look at some APIs of note. And I'm going to talk about the latest versions of Chrome for Android and Safari on iOS. And if you're familiar with developing for web views on iOS, you know that uh, Chrome is actually limited by Safari because Chrome uses a web view uh, that the operating system provides, which is, uh, the same, uh, it was, is the same as Safari, more or less. So I've got these nine categories we're going to dive into uh, one by one, starting with native behaviors. And I'm going to show these tables, but look at these later on the slides because I'm not going to review them in detail. So native behaviors like, do I get notifications? Can I know if I'm in the foreground? Can I set permissions for the app? The short story of this is for iOS web, there's no push notification support yet. And there's no indication when there will be. This depends on them implementing service worker to the spec, which there are some indications that they've started, but they haven't publicly stated that they have started on implementing service worker. Uh, then you've got surroundings, like how can I interact with the world around me, Bluetooth and NFC. The short story is Bluetooth and Chrome is coming soon. Um, Tori Shaked actually has a lot of demos with this. He may be speaking on that at the conference. I'm not sure. Um, but uh, iOS doesn't have any web timeline. So this is spec. Chrome has it as a as an experiment, and you can play with that today. And then device features, like knowing the network info, battery state, am I online, being able to control the vibration motor. Um, the short story is battery and network info are, are not available in iOS web. Are you seeing a pattern? 
Uh, Android is pretty, Android and Chrome, and also worth noting, most other browsers on Android tend to be uh, ahead of the game too. They, like they have support for service worker and push notifications and installed home screen. Uh, so even though I'm focusing on Chrome in these. Uh, so getting the seamless experience, like how easily do I open the app? Does it feel like native? Uh, so having an offline mode where I can load the app offline. Um, having home screen installation so I can launch from the home, home screen, being able to sync things in the background being able to commun communicate with other apps. The short story is that full off screen and full screen are possible everywhere, uh, but with iOS web, it's not ideal. It's kind of hidden in obscure features of bookmarking and meta tags that most users don't know enough about to actually take advantage of. So you can do home screen and, uh, and, f and, and also full offline depends on application cache, which has been deprecated and is pretty riddled with traps and, uh, and dangers. Uh, so then my camera and microphone, uh, this is, so being able to capture video, do uh, real-time calling and recording. Uh, in Chrome, there's a lot of support coming soon that's um, experimental right now. Uh, but for iOS web, no real timeline on when you can access these things. So screen and output, being able to go full screen, being able to check screen orientation and stop the screen from going to sleep. Uh, iOS web doesn't support wake lock or screen orientation events. And again, full screen support is possible in Safari, but it's obscured. So input, how do users interact with the device? Uh, touch gestures, speech, rec speech recognition, which is relatively new for web, uh, clipboard access and fingerprint auth. Uh, so touch support is everywhere, that's great. Uh, you can have touch events and you can use libraries that make those easy to work with. Uh, fingerprint auth is something that's pretty interesting but is right now only available on um, iOS hybrid native. And when I say only available on iOS hybrid native, I'm sure you could, uh, with Ionic or native script, work with Android's fingerprint auth API. There just aren't plugins out of the box right now that work with it. Um, and no timeline on when those will be available in web. So there's one category where iOS leads, I guess. Um, so location and position, knowing where a user is, knowing what position their device is in, and, and knowing when they leave or enter a place, and uh, and being able to track device motion events on uh, accelerometer, gyroscope, uh, sensors individually. Location, yes, you can know a user's location. Geofencing is not quite available on the web. You can hack it. So you could, you could just pull the user's location and, have, and then check when they've entered a certain area, but you can't just say, let me know when the user has got to this area. That's not natively supported. Um, so with native and hybrid, you can have that feature. So operating system, so being able to access offline storage, file system, being able to access APIs like contacts, calendar, and being able to do payments. The great story is offline storage payments are available everywhere. So Safari and, and uh, Chrome have different implementations of the payments API, but you can pay with your native uh, payments integration. And uh, no contact or calendar access, and there's no timeline or chatter that I've seen of being able to work with these things directly. You could use APIs, like if somebody's using Google Apps, you could access their calendar and contacts through that, but not ideal. So I'm going to go into performance, and uh, I've just got a few things to say here, not a whole lot of depth, but 60 frames per second, you know, smooth, no jank scrolling and interacting, is achievable anywhere. Um, with web, you can do it. With hybrid, you can do it. With native, you can do it. Native UI uh, tends to deliver the easiest uh, experience to make this happen. The components are more hardware accelerated. You can. Uh, um, you can just leverage them out of the box and, and they tend to be better. But it's worth noting that bad performance is just as easily accomplished on any platform. If you as a developer are lazy and not thinking about performance, um, you can make something really slow. And I've, it, I've seen this in practice too many times to, to recount. But uh, you have to be smart, you have to think about performance. Uh, if you're smart you can, and you put enough effort, you can make anything fast. I encourage you to look into these frameworks yourself and see uh, and experience and see like how they feel, how performant they are, because that's what really matters is the user experience um, and how the user perceives the, the transitions, animations, and interactions. So the last section, productivity, how productive, how effective are you going to be with these different solutions? Um, really, there, there are four things I would think about with productivity and things that you need to look out on your own, look at how your team works and how well you can play with these different tools. Testability is a big one. Angular itself, we care a lot about this. And these tools like Ionic, NativeScript, and others in the system will 
uh, probably leverage Angular testability and build things in that line. So this is pretty well covered by everyone. Um, but having a good testing story, mocking and, and uh, unit testing is really key. And then community. So how, how active is the community? How engaged is the community? How excited is the community? Are they building plugins? Are they helping people? Are you going to be able to get help when you get stuck on something? And then extensibility. Is there a plugin architecture? Is there a time when I'm going to get stuck and I won't be able to get out of something using, using one of these tools? And code sharing. How much code can I share between my application? So with hybrid, you, can, you could share pretty much your whole application with just a few things here and there. Uh, with, with native JavaScript or, or with native script, you could have services or things that are purely JavaScript shared. Um, but uh, it's, it's up to you to decide how much you can share between the two and how much that saves you. So to conclude, I covered a lot of stuff. I probably forgot some things and got some details wrong. Um, but I did get a lot of help from people to, to make sure I was representing things correctly. Um, so I'd like to encourage you to try Angular 2 for, uh, for na native script, web, and Ionic on your own. Uh, check out the developer experience. They've all done a great job at making it easy to try these things. And uh, then evaluate you know, how well they meet your goals. And I just want to say thank you to folks from Telerik, uh, from Ionic, and uh, Addy at Google and John Papa from Disney for the help in uh, getting the content together for this slide and uh, in general just being helpful otherwise. Um, thank you. Here are the links to projects. I'll tweet these slides and I'll share them later. So thank you very much. Yeah.